Hi everyone, I'm Dave. And I'm Robert. Welcome to Chipola's fifth quarter podcast. We're excited to be filming from our main campus in Mariana, Florida. We're so thankful for Chipola College for sponsoring this podcast where we get a chance to look at the great sport of football and talk about some principles that tie from the gridiron to our bachelor's degrees in management, looking at leadership concepts, teamwork, just important um, concepts that you can apply to the everyday work environment. So, Robert, what do you have to get us started today? Uh, well, speaking of teamwork, uh, Florida State took on Duke last weekend, and it was great to see some teamwork uh, amongst them. Uh, beating Duke 56 to 35, uh, it's great to get a win again. You know, we had two weeks off, uh, so it was it was kind of rough there. You know, the Clemson game didn't happen, uh, and then they canceled uh, the other game the following week. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, so, you know, there was about a two-week period where we weren't playing any games. There, there was so much drama. You know, players were entering into the transfer portal and, and things were just going awry. And here we're picking it back up with a win. Uh, you know, Florida State capping it off and proving to three and six, you know, which is still not 500, but, you know, a win is a win. And, you know, it's very exciting to see uh, what the future holds in store for FSU. Jordan Travis uh, getting it done for us at quarterback, 13 for 18, 192 yards with two touchdowns. Uh, the guy's really improving. You know, the, I think this was the season where um, we, you know, we're going to see what he was made of, and I think he showed it. You know, he's, he's really impressed me. Uh, but there's a, a little challenge coming up. Mackenzie Milton transferred from UCF. The news came down uh, the end of last week. He's got one year of eligibility left, and it's my understanding he chose FSU. Uh, to come here as a quarterback. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so the, the experts were saying during the Duke game that this is Jordan Travis. Uh, this is his time to step up and say, okay, you know, I'm going to battle for that position. Even though he's young, I think he's like a sophomore. Uh, Mackenzie Milton having, you know, one year of eligibility, still Jordan Travis to try to battle for that position to prove that, you know, he's the man for the job. And in those QB battles, things can get kind of heated. Uh, but I think they'll figure that stuff out. FSU really – you know, really impressive this game, even though it is Duke, you know, scoring 28 points in the first quarter. Uh, that was pretty impressive. Uh, Duke scored two uh, touchdowns in the second, nothing in the third uh, for Duke. And then FSU gets two touchdowns in the third and fourth to cap it off 56 to 35. Really impressive win. Looks like a basketball score. Almost. You need to get some defensive players out there too. <clears throat> well, the rushing game done pretty good too. You know, to fill out with seven carries for 117 yards. <clears throat> he was averaging, I think, 16.7 yards a carry. So, you know, the rushing game got, you know, really got it done. But talking about rushing, I, I've got to give a shout out to the North Carolina Tar Heels. I don't know if you caught any of the game over the weekend, but they torched Miami on the ground, 550 yards rushing. I did catch that. They were saying that if Miami wins that game, they could have a shot at the big six bowl games. Yeah, well, UNC said, I'm packing. Yeah, they didn't have yeah. a chance once the, the a whistle chance. blew and the, the yeah. game started. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember a time when uh, a team got 550 yards rushing. You know, North Carolina is one of those teams that, you know, their football program, as we talked about earlier, you know, it's, it's not really been that impressive. They're more of a basketball school. So, you know, since Mac Brown came back to North Carolina, I think he's, he's starting to draw an interest into their football program. Yeah, he's bringing some of that, <clears throat> that Texas toughness, that uh, focus that he had with the, uh, the Longhorns. So um, maybe UNC will, will get some more wins. And they started kind of what, I mean, the top 25, and then they made it maybe to close to the top 10, UNC that is, yeah. and then fell with a couple of losses. But Miami, wow, it talks about uh, strength of schedule means a whole, a whole bunch. So they were heading to the game. I think they might have had one loss or no losses, I think. That's why they were saying they might get a, a big six bowl game. All they had to do was win out, and um, that, that ended quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. no doubt. <clears throat> but what I really want to talk about is this Florida LSU game. Um, you know, we talked last week about the Gators and, and how we could see the Gators beating LSU. Uh, that clearly was not the case. LSU ended up with the upset, three points, 37-34. LSU leaves the swamp. It was it was a very interesting game. It was kind of gridlocked that first half. You know, LSU started gaining some momentum, and then, you know, Florida's defense started stepping up, but they weren't able to score any more points to kind of tie the game up. Uh, going into the half, you know, if I'm Dan Mullen, I'm thinking, guys, you know, we better come back out that second half strong because, you know, you're talking about playoff chances. You're talking about the SEC bid, Kyle Trask. You know, his name's being thrown in there for the Heisman. So this is not a game where you want to throw it away, so to speak. Uh, but coming back out that second half, you know, Florida fought. Uh, but there's one thing that happened. Marco Wilson, uh, I believe he's number three for the Gators, ended up with an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. Uh, LSU had the ball. Uh, you know, defense for, for Florida was really playing well this game from what I could tell. 
Uh, but that unsportsmanlike conduct penalty is what will come back to haunt them. Forever. Gave LSU a first down when they needed it. <clears throat> and, and those unsportsmanlike conduct penalties, man, they hurt because I think it's 15, 20 yards downfield. LSU drives down the field, kicks the field goal. It was it was like a 57, 58-yard attempt, maybe in a 59. I could be stretching that, but it was somewhere in the 50s range. And he nailed it in, in the middle of fog and everything uh, down there in Gainesville to, to pull off a, a three-point lead. Uh, and, and it just goes to show you, that it, it come back to bite him uh, because Florida gets the ball back. Kyle Trask, you know, he, he put up impressive numbers. He was 29 for 47, uh, 474 yards passing. I mean, that's that's definitely Heisman noteworthy. Uh, he had two touchdowns in the game, so there's no question about his performance during the LSU game. The only problem was the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty now put Florida back in the hole. They drive down the field. Uh, they get into field goal range. He hooks it wide left, and Florida has to end up uh, suffering defeat, 37-34. And, and I was talking to somebody about this today is that's very selfish. You know, you can't be undisciplined like that. You know, when, when you're quarterback, you know, no matter what position you play, <clears throat> If your quarterback, you know, is the talk of the town as far as Heisman is and your team's performing well and you have a, sh a shot, you know, at going to the playoffs, I don't think I'd, I'd want to, to throw that away, you know, on the, the whim of pride and just oh, – Just well, one moment. Yeah, just one moment. And it, it, was in, it was a moment where a poor decision was made. Uh, and if you watch the game, you know what I'm talking about. He picks up the LSU player's shoe. You know, he lost his shoe during a, a tackle. Well, the play's over, and instead of handing the guy back his cleat, he takes it and chunks it downfield. On national TV, <clears throat> for everybody. I don't know what the guy was saying. I mean, you know, at this point, they might as well star him in a movie called The Soul of a Man. <laughs> You know, I mean, you hate we're working on that one. Well, but I mean, you, you hate to say it like that, and, and obviously not a Gator fan, but you don't be selfish, man, because now it's like Florida will always go back to this game and think, man, if you hadn't threw that shoe and got that unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, where would we be? Probably in the top four of the playoffs. I can go ahead and tell you right now, they lost to, at the time, a 3-5 and five LSU team. So, you know, if you sit here and tell me that by some miracle Florida still gets a shot in the playoffs, I, I fail to see that. I just don't think it's going to be possible. Right. You talk about leadership in the locker room. You have to think that LSU was focusing on that scheme with the Gators as their bowl game. They went in and, and put all the chips on the table. This was for the – use another analogy for the whole bag of marbles. This was it. And they showed up to win. Yeah. I mean, they, they clearly came to play. Yeah. And I think the pressure was really on Florida more than anything else. You know, Florida coming into the game, Kyle Trask, you know, Heisman talking. And I think some of those players were already looking forward to the SEC game in Atlanta. So I think their focus was everywhere but that game. You Again, know, leadership in the locker room. Yeah, lost it, focus. It, it does. You know, you cannot do that. It, and it just, man, it, it – it, it, pains me for him, you know. I mean, I kind of laughed at it because it's like, man, you're going to be remembered as the team that blew a game over an unsportsmanlike conduct. Penalty. Yeah, and so much was riding on that. You talk about if they won that game, you know, they could actually have a shot at the SEC championship. Mm -hmm. um, and then the winner of that game would probably obviously get it. Alabama will probably maintain a bid, but Florida would have had one in the top four most likely. And they probably the winning quarterback would have the, the kind of be the front runner for the Heisman. Absolutely. So they, they lost everything in that one game. Yep. They can still become SEC champions, though. Possibly, possibly. But uh, might, might get them a big six, you know, a bowl game bid, but definitely not in the top four, I wouldn't nope. think. No, and you got you got to figure Florida was number six going into this game. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot riding on their shoulders. You know, you're, you're two rankings away from possibly landing a playoff spot, and it's just poor decision-making. You know, it, it's – you know, I can't imagine how they're feeling right now knowing they were possibly two rankings away uh, from – you know, getting getting a playoff bid because it you know they've been through their fair share of of coaches and you know they've had those years where they've been up and down. You know, nothing's just coming coming together. Nothing's going right. Here they they get a coach that actually wants to invest in the program and really knows what he's doing. And you know, everybody thought this was going to be the Gators' year. I mean, even I was looking at him thinking, man, they may unexpectedly. Make a run. They, yes. Yeah. So um, let's kind of put our uh, business caps on here and look at leadership even more. Uh, we didn't have any prep on this thought, so I apologize, Robert. But what do you think is the bigger challenge, the FSU year of just losing nonstop? And, and they beat Duke, but does that actually count as a win? I mean, kind of a win. Or, or the Gators where they had the shot right there at the doorway to go to the championship game, you know, be in a playoff berth, and, and they fall short. What, what is the, the hardest one to manage as a leader, you think? Here's my perspective, and I'm, I'm going to try to say this with as little bias as possible, okay? I think the FSU one is the hardest, and I'll tell you why. You know, we've been used to years and years of unprecedented dominance. You know, the Gators, you know, they, they had their run in 96 with the national championship. I believe it was Steve Spurrier was their coach. 
you know, and they had some pretty pretty good seasons, you know, an SEC championship here and there. Then Weren't they back to back with Tebow? National champions? Or they at least had one with him. Yeah, right? they yeah. had two with Tebow, but okay. it was not back to back. I want to say there was a break okay. uh, the next year. But, you know, the Tebow era happened. Right. You know, Urban Meyer come to town and, and they got it together and, and rallied a winning team. And, you know, they won a couple of national championships and, uh, you know, some SEC championships and all that stuff. I, I'd say FSU's probably got the, the hardest, you know, because it's, you know, you, you've been through two coaches the last few years. And I don't want to take anything away from the Gators because they've had their fair share of coaches. But it's like, you know, FSU, they're just searching for the man that wants to stay and invest in the program. Right now, you know, you, you've got a guy, you know, it's his first year, so everybody's expecting him to, you know, pull out a miracle. That's just – that don't always happen, you know. And, and, you know, you've got to stop putting your chips, you know, all in on one man. You know, you got to give him time, two or three years tops. Heck, I mean, if you want to get technical, give him four or five years and see what he can really do. At least give him the length of one contract before you try to ride him out of town on a log, as the old saying goes. Right, and you talk about the the opportunity at FSU, bringing in another quarterback. The competition could really bring out the best in them for the upcoming season, especially the quarterback position. Well, I mean, you know, when I was in law enforcement for the last four years, some of our instructors, as a matter of fact, it was here at Chipola, used to tell us, you know, our job is to get you to perform well under pressure, and it's – really no different with football you know there, there's a lot of pressure on game day and you know you want to go out there and win and you've got you know at, at Doak Campbell Stadium you've got 88,000 strong you know when the stadium is packed of course um, that want to see you perform and go get the win you know that <clears throat> that's a lot of pressure you know for you know a sophomore to go out and say hey you're starting this game in front of 88,000 people you know to a, a redshirt junior or a, a senior that's nothing they're used to that kind of hype uh, but you, you stick a freshman and sophomore out there, very rarely can they handle that kind of pressure. Excellent. So we say FSU probably has the uh, the greatest challenge in front of them. I mean, Florida was right there. And if they can cap it off with an SEC championship, that's a pretty successful year. They'd probably get one of the top six bowls. Yeah. And, um, and they can hang their hat on that. But uh, no Heisman probably, no national champion for sure. Um, I guess that's right there. That, that You know, that's just one step away <clears> from <throat> – you know, going all the way. And um, FSU has still a lot to build. They have a long ways to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. My hat's off to them. Uh, And, you know, Florida's not totally out of the question. You know, that a committee may get together, you know, late December and say, you know what, let's give them a shot, even though they got two losses on the board, you know, their performance as well. Because it's hard for me to accept uh, a five or six, you know, game team into the playoffs. It's like, look, you know, I was having this conversation with somebody today. How fair is it to take a team that's played a full season and you just strike them from the record, yet you give a team that's undefeated, quote-unquote, but they've only played five or six games. I just don't see the logic in that. Is that kind of a shout-out to Ohio State or something, maybe? Uh, I'm, I'm going to hold my opinion <laughs> on Ohio State. But. So so lastly, on the college note, um, if we're kind of following the trend of college and pro for our podcast today, Robert, uh, Miami, where do they go? I mean, they were right there on the, on the doorstep for a big six bowl, and then they just got crushed. Well, I mean, is that even – I guess you, you give them a pass, right? Well, I, I guess I could give them a pass. I mean, they are one of our biggest rivalries. Uh, but what I want to say is, you know, quit saying the U is back. Make sure you're actually back first before you say the U is back. True. That, was that game at home or was it in, in North Carolina? I want to say it was at home. I know, which makes it worse. Yeah, yeah even worse. There's going to be a lot of angry fans in Dade County. All right, so the pro game. Yeah, let's segue over into the pro. So the Tampa Bay Bucks, uh, they were seven and five at the time, uh, taking on the Minnesota Vikings at home in Tampa, uh, improving to eight and five. They beat the Vikings uh, by a score of twenty-six to fourteen. Very impressive game. Defense recorded five sacks. You know, Kirk Cousins, Minnesota's quarterback, uh, he didn't have a whole lot of room to work with. You know, the defense was all over him. You know, allowed him two touchdowns because uh, they they found some loopholes in the defense. But it was a really impressive game. Uh, and it just inches our chances closer to clinching a wild card berth. Um, the man, Tom Brady, you know, he was 5 for 23, 196 yards, uh, two touchdowns with no interceptions. The rushing game was good. You know, Ronald Jones, the second, averaged 18 yards, uh, 80 yards, excuse me, on 18 carries, averaging four and a half yards a carry. Uh, Scotty Miller, you know, called, I believe it was a 60 or 70 something yard pass downfield. You know, Brady was. Uh, quick to find him, um, you know, it was it was kind of shaky there to start off. Uh, but I, I think Tampa Bay, you know, this game was a, a good moral victory for them moving forward to the playoffs. So you look at Brady, some of the analysts are kind of uh, breaking down his game right now because maybe they're haters or they want to learn from mm-hmm. it. So they say if you put pressure on Brady, 
he kind of drops the ball. No pun intended. He fails. He gets sacked. You know, he'll he'll throw an interception. Um, if there's no pressure on him, he can pick you apart. So if you look at the losses they've had, they've actually uh, put pressure on him, and they're saying if you put pressure on him, they're not going to advance out of the wild card. What's your take on that, Robert? Well, here's my take on it. Tom, Tom Brady's used to – uh, the style of play when he was at New England. You know, they had a very solid offensive line. They gave him plenty. Man, he could have made a sandwich, went and used the restroom, done whatever he wanted to do, and still had time to throw the ball. Right, you right. get to Tampa, you know, our issue at Tampa is the O-line is not as solid as it was at New England. You know, we need to fix some of the, the O-line issues, and, and these guys got to understand Brady's 42 years old. You know, sometimes he plays like he's in his 20s. You know, we talked about that before. But you got to give the man time to throw the ball. He's not Lamar Jackson. He's not Patrick Mahomes. You know, he can't just scramble out of the pocket and make a miracle. You know, otherwise you're going to find him with a walker trying to jog downfield <laughs> 20 yards. So that's an O-line challenge. Okay, so when I saw those analysts report, that, that's a neat lens. I think it's an O-line challenge because mm-hmm. they can work on beefing that up and command that internally. If it's uh, how I read it was maybe it's just the defensive structure. So if a team is playing them and, and they're willing to roll the dice – they just blitz every other down, and they just take him out of his game. It seems like when they've lost, the defense has put a lot of pressure on them. And but maybe a solid O line, if they can uh, get a chance to strengthen that up before the playoffs, could help them. But uh, that was a great win for them. Yeah, it was. It was a good moral victory, and and just kind of segueing into some playoff talk. You know, here we are. You know, Christmas is what a week away, so we got what, you know, two or three more weeks. We're going into the new year. Uh, you know, we're going to start talking about the playoffs. So let, let's look at where we're at. You know, kind of wrap this up. Uh, with some playoff scenarios. Right now, as it stands, uh, the Chiefs are number one in the AFC West. They're 12-1. and one. They clinch their division. Uh, you know, they're, they're facing the Saints coming up next. Uh, Steelers are number two. They're 11-2, first in the AFC North. Uh, so th- you can bet that the Chiefs and the Steelers have clinched a playoff spot, uh, you know, as has some other teams. Uh, these teams right here are in the hunt still. Uh, the Buffalo Bills, they're 10-3, and three, first in the AFC East. Uh, you got the Tennessee Titans, 9-4 and four, right now through week 14. They're first in the AFC South. Uh, Cleveland Browns had a pretty impressive season, probably the best season they probably had in about, what, 10, 13 years? Yeah, amazing. They just uh, lost with the other night, right? I mean, it was close. Yeah, it was close, but it was to the Ravens. Yeah. So you you got all these different scenarios. You know, Tampa Bay for the NFC, just to kind of wrap this up real quick. You know, Tampa Bay, Seattle, those teams are in the hunt. Pittsburgh's in the hunt, um, I believe. Kansas City and Green Bay clinched their division. The Saints clinched a spot. So we're just going to have to see going into the new year, you know, what happens. I still think uh, Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Bucks got to pull out wins. You know, you can't, you can't have any more losses. I think uh, we're just one loss away from losing the wild card spot. And there's a great opportunity there. I mean, the Saints have a, a backup quarterback that's starting now. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Drew Brees may not make it back in time for, yeah. uh, for the playoffs. Uh, Hill has been doing a good job, but they showed some weakness. They, they lost. Yeah. Uh, um, so they won't win them all, but no one will. Yeah. Um, and what about the Steelers? My goodness. So I guess uh, Miami has corked the champagne, uncorked the champagne, and they're celebrating. Was it the 72 season, the last undefeated team in the NFL? Yep. And Pittsburgh was close. But in the last two games, I think, with two or three losses in a row, mm-hmm. I think two in a row, they're showing that uh, that they can be beat. You know, they're yeah. not the team to run the table and be undefeated. They may not even make it out of the playoffs. Yep. Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. Like I said, going into the new year, I guess we'll know where we're at. Uh, and that's about all I got, man. You know, like I said, it's it's getting close to playoff time for college and pros. So I'm um, looking forward to, to capping off a great season with you. Great. So when we uh, meet back, we'll have the holidays behind us. We'll have a chance to kind of look at the bowls. There might still be some going on, I think. And we'll get a chance to look at the uh, the later rounds of the playoffs for the uh, NFL. So it's a good times ahead, Robert. Mm-hmm. All right. Look forward to it, sir. Yep. See you guys in 2021. All right.